of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Well, good morning and welcome to Riverbend Church. We're so glad to have you here today uh, as a part of the Riverbend family, whether you're here in the room or joining us online. We're so glad to have you here today, and we hope that you feel God's presence as we worship Him together. Uh, if you are here in the room, make sure you take out your phones, open up the Church Track app, check in, let us know you're here. If you do not have the Church Track app downloaded, you can take your phone out as well and scan the QR code on the pew in front of you. That will carry you to an online connection card. We'd love for you to do that. You can sign up for events, give us prayer requests, and just let us know you're here and how we can better serve you as we serve Christ. If you are joining us online, <coughs> excuse me. If you are joining us online, make sure you just click the link that'll carry you to that same card and you can do all those things that I just mentioned. Uh, as you're doing that, I only have one quick announcement today. First of all, well, only all of all, uh, uh, we're going to begin today receiving the offering for the Baptist Children's Home. Uh, there is an insert in your bulletin, uh, as well as offering envelopes in the back in the, by the Connection Center. Uh, this is a great way for us to do what Scripture has told us to do, to take care of orphans. And uh, the Baptist Children's Homes of North Carolina do a phenomenal job of providing a place for those, those children to be ministered to. So let's make sure we uh, do that and give over and above so that we can see these children impacted with the gospel. Uh, we're going to be celebrating communion today, so if you did not pick up your communion elements on the way in, just raise your hand. Someone in, will bring you those to you right now. Uh, we've got one here right here. If somebody would bring some communion elements for one of the ushers if you would do that. Uh, they're taken care of. We're good. All right, well, we will be doing that a little bit later on in the service, so be prepared for that as we continue to worship Jesus. Now, before we do go into worship this morning, I want to recognize Christy Dino, our children, uh, excuse me, our women's ministry leader here at Riverbend. Good morning, Riverbend. How's everyone this morning? Let's stand to our feet. I hope you came seeking the Lord this morning because you know the Lord is always here. And when you leave church and you, and you say um, on the way home, you know, I just didn't feel it this morning. It wasn't him. It was you. So make sure let's clear our minds this morning because we bring a lot of junk to church with us that, that, that get in there and it, it takes up room that the Lord wants to take room in. So let's empty ourselves this morning, lay it at the foot of the cross, let Jesus have it, let Jesus take care of it, and let's worship him with everything that we have in us, because he alone is worthy. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day that you've given us to come into your house. What an honor and privilege it is to be in the throne room this morning. God, we pray now that you join us. We invite you here. Move among us, God. We're praying for a special and, and, and extra anointing of your Holy Spirit this morning, Father. Pour on us, Father. Live through us. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. We're in the house of the Lord this morning.
the Lord. It's all in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout at your praise. It's all in the house of the Lord. Our God is holy in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout at your praise. Give him some more praise. Come on. He, he deserves it. Amen. And I hope you realize this morning when we talk about the house of the Lord, we're not talking about this building or this structure. We're talking about the heart of the person who's been born again. You are the house of the Lord. And when we come together like this for corporate worship, we're just adding the, the, the worship that we've given our Savior throughout the week as the house of the Lord, we're adding that together. We're adding our voices together and we're lifting up this great congregational praise to the King. And He's worthy of every bit of it. Amen. Who in here this morning knows that God has done something incredible in your life this week? Whether you're, whether you're aware of it or not, God has done something incredible. So every one of us has something to give God praise for today. And you know what? I'm not going to let the rocks be louder than me. How about you? Let's give him one more shout of praise this morning. Come on. Let him know. Let him know. All right, guys. If the Lord builds the house, ain't nobody can tear it down.
fills the house. Nobody can tear it down. And it's still going to There's nothing but a shame. It's real. If the Lord fills the house, nobody can tear it down. If the Lord fills the house, nobody can tear it down. If the Lord fills the house, nobody can tell you how the Lord built the house. On the last day that Jesus would be with his disciples, he gathered with them up in an upper room to celebrate the Passover. Passover was the, the highest, most holy day of the Jewish worship in the temple. For it celebrated God's miraculous provision in bringing his people out of bondage in Egypt and planting them in their very own land just as he had promised that he would. Each year the, the, the Jewish people would come to Jerusalem and celebrate what God had done to deliver them. And in the course of that celebration a perfect spotless lamb would be offered as a sacrifice on the altar covering the sin of the people for that year it was in the context of that Passover festival that Jesus came to Jerusalem to offer himself as the sinless sacrifice that would not just cover the sin of the people for that year, but he would cover the sin once and for all. That night, sitting around that table celebrating, Jesus took the elements that were there at the table, the cup and the bread, and he forever transformed to enduring symbols of his deep love for his father and for us. He commanded that as often as we eat and drink of it, and we do it in remembrance of him. Not remembrance in the sense of remembering a past hero like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington someone that did something meaningful that we want to commemorate but to remember him as the living Savior who offered his life's blood once and for all so that you and I, all who call upon his name in faith might be forever saved and spend eternity with him in heaven Jesus took said, this is my body that's going to be broken for you. Take and eat every bit of it in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood that's going to be spilled it only takes one drop to wash away our sin. Take and drink every bit of it in remembrance of me. The scripture says that after this had taken place, 
disciples that Jesus left the upper room and began the journey to the Garden of Gethsemane and ultimately to the cross and then the empty tomb. You know, the beautiful thing about communion is it doesn't just look back at Jesus' death and burial. It looks forward to His resurrection and then ultimately to His coming. For you see, He told His disciples He was not going to drink of the fruit of the vine again until He drank it with them and knew the throne of Jesus and we're going to endure we're going to enjoy this meal together again and this time though it it won't be through the eyes of faith it will be through sight because we will see Jesus as he is the living reigning savior and in that moment Because we will see the love in the eyes of the one that loves us more than we could ever imagine. Church, do y'all think that's a reason for us to worship Him today? Do, do you think that might be a, a, a motivation for us to praise His great name this morning? Let's continue as we worship Him. And let's thank Him goodness and His grace.
let those rocks cry out this morning. Oh, and I won't let the rocks cry out in my pain. Oh, no. Oh, no. We return the breath you gave with the praise. Oh, I won't let the rock cry out in my place. We return the breath you gave with the praise. I won't let the rock in my place. I won't let the rock in my place. We return the breath. 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 We That's what it's going to sound like in heaven. Us all praising our na- our Jesus' name in one voice Amen. and in one spirit.
feet, Jesus, this morning. Praise his name this morning. Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the name of Jesus. We 
thank you that he came to this earth. He walked among us. He was despised, spit on, scoffed. Yet he never lost the vision that you had. He allowed himself to be taken into custody by man. He was tried, convicted, sentenced to death. He carried his own cross to the hill of Golgotha. Where he laid down his life that you and I might live. <laughs> but that's not where the story ends. On the third day, on the third day, right at this very moment he sits at the right hand of the father and guess what he knows your name and he's saying to his father right now father that's one of mine so this morning we have nothing to dread we have nothing to fear because we belong to him. Father God, we thank you. Yes. In the trials of life, help us to never lose the vision of everything that you have done for us because you love us. That's right. Not because you expected anything out of us, because you knew us, because you created us. And you know that we're untrustworthy, but you love us. So God, help us to cling to that when life gets hard. When times, when, times when things just aren't going our way. Yes. Help us to hold close to you. Yes. Father God, we love you and we thank you. We lift our hands to you, for it is in your holy and precious name we pray. And all God's children said... You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward to receive our morning tithes and offerings. But y'all keep in mind, this is not an indication that somehow worship is ending and we're on to the next thing. Because we are called in the Holy Bible to give of our time and our talents and our tithes all in appreciation for all that he has blessed us with. And keep in mind, None of it is ours anyway. It's his.
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and ask our kids, uh, if you haven't already, you can be dismissed to head over to kids' worship so you guys can head on and enjoy your time there as we enjoy our time here. Who is thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Anybody? Yeah. You know, I heard a long time ago when I was a kid growing up, if that didn't light your fire, your wood is wet. Amen. Uh, if, if you didn't feel the presence of Jesus in this place today, see me at the end of this service, and we will pray for you and see if you can't get a, get a connection with him. Because Wow. It's amazing to be in the house of the Lord today. It's amazing to feel his presence as we gather for worship and this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6. That's going to be our text for this morning. Uh, it's going to be up on the screens, and I want you to look at it in your Bible. I want you to open up your Bibles, because I hope that you brought your Bible with you to church. If you didn't bring your Bible to church, that's like walking out on a battlefield without your sword. And so you're out there and you're kind of, you know, in trouble. So hopefully you got your Bible this morning and you can open it up to Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to ask that you stand. We're going to read it together. It's going to be on the screen. Uh, we're going to read this from the screen so it'll all be in the same uh, translation. There's something about hearing God's word in your voice that really opens up your heart to receive what the Spirit wants to say. So uh, join me as we read these first six verses of Genesis chapter 15. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? Since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Abram continued, Look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him, This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. I pray that you will remove every barrier every distraction, anything, Lord, that would take our minds off of you and your word and put it on the things of this world and our flesh. Father, we, we need a word from you today. And I just pray, God, that we would set our minds to hearing from you. But Lord, the deficit never is you. If we fail to hear from you, the connection is, that, that's the problem, is on our end. So today, God, we just say, Lord, speak to your people. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture says that Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him. As righteousness. It doesn't say that. Abram. Did a lot of works. For the Lord. And he credited it. To him. As righteousness. It doesn't say that. Abram. Attended. Church. Every time. The doors. Were open. And God credited it to him as righteousness. It says very clearly that Abram believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. Now looking at where we are in Genesis, we find here this powerful interaction between God and Abram. 
We find Abram here in the first verse of 15. He, he, he's there and the word of the Lord comes to him in a vision. And God says to him, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. Your reward's going to be very great. You know, coming out of chapter 14, we know that Abram has had to go to war. He's had to fight some battles. And he's surrounded by pagan kings who are trying their best to try to trick him into swearing allegiance to them. And it's in the context of this warfare and this fear that, that God comes to him and speaks to him, Abram, don't be afraid. I'm going to make you very great. And never forget, I'm your shield. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when the warfare seems so intense. Everywhere I turn, it seems there is a conflict or there's a problem or there's some situation that seems much bigger than my capacity to overcome. Have you been there, church? And in those moments, because I am a human being just like Abram, fear begins to, to fill me. And every now and then, I need for God to remind me that He's there. You know what's always remarkable about God's Word is we see the humanity of the, the great heroes of the faith. I mean, God has already promised Abraham about three times that He's going to make of him a great nation. But God continues to remind him, continues to keep that promise out in front of him. Because you see, life has a way of distracting us, doesn't it? It has a way of ha having us take our eyes off of what God has said, what God has promised, and put it on all of the noise all around us. And if we're not careful, we'll begin to let fear and doubt reign supreme in our hearts, and, and we forget the word from the Lord. We forget what God has spoken over us and to us. We forget that we belong to Him. You know, I think sometimes that's a challenge for us modern believers. We forget whose we are. We forget who we belong to. You know, we, we, we look around us and we see all the things that are going on in the world. We see the, the wars and the rumors of wars. We see the, the things happening in our country. We see... You know, some of our freedoms that we've held so, so tightly before becoming a little less sure. We see all these things happening and, and we're, we're, we're moved toward fear. We begin to question and doubt, what are we going to do if this happens? What, what's going to happen if this takes place? What happens if this, this particular government begins to, to make moves in, in, the, in the part of the world and begins to take control? And we, we were tempted to hoard fear and despair. And then we start putting our trust in things that were never meant to be ultimate. Ultimate. We begin to, to think that if we can just elect the right president, he's going to fix it all. If the Israelis and the Palestinians would just knock it off, that somehow we can all join hands and sing Kumbaya around the fire and everything's going to be great. We're setting ourselves up for disappointment. Because you see, our trust belongs in the one to whom we belong. I got to feel like that's kind of what God is saying to Abram in this particular instance. Abram, I realize you've just had to face battle. And you were victorious because you listened to me. 
But I want you to be careful, Abram. I don't want you to look around and I don't want you to get afraid of all of the other kings and all of the city-states that are around you and, and start to fear that you're going to have to fight all of these people to maintain your peace. But also, Abram, I don't want you to get too, too big for your britches. That's what my mama used to say. Don't, don't get too big for your britches. I don't want you to start thinking that because you were successful in this, this campaign that you did it in your own strength and, and it was by your own military genius that you were able to overcome this adversary. I don't want you to get too low, but I certainly don't want you to get too high. I want you to always remember, I'm your shield. God here is making him a promise. Abraham... In verse 2, does something kind of interesting. God just made him this promise. Again, this is about the third time God has told him these things. And what does Abraham say? Uh, Lord, what can you give me since I'm childless? And, and the, this, this slave heir in my, my house, well, he's going to be my heir. He's going to be the guy that inherits everything that I own. And he continues, he says, look, you've given me no offspring. He's challenging God. He's saying, God, yes, you made a promise to me. I remember. You've told me a couple of times that you're going to make of me a great nation, that you're going to make my descendants like the, the sands of the, the grains of sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. You're going to make me this great people. But God, here I am. And it's still just me and Sarah. And Lord, we are not getting any younger. In fact, we're old. And there's another problem, God. She's barren. She's never had a child. And yet you're telling me. You're telling me you're going to make of me of this great nation. And my reward's going to be great. But God, it's not happening. Have you ever done that with God, church? God, you said. You said, God, but I don't see it happening. How many of us understand that God's timeline and ours don't often coordinate. That's kind of what Abraham is saying right here. God, you said you were going to do this. You said it a couple of times and you just said it again. But yet, Lord, how's this going to happen? I don't see it. And then God speaks. This one that you've mentioned is not going to be your heir. One that comes from your own body is going to be your heir. And by the way, Abram, go outside. Look up at the sky and you count the stars. If you can count the number of stars, that's how numerous your offspring are going to be from your body. God once again confirms his promise to Abram. And then we get to verse 6. Abram believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed. Belief is messy. You know that. Now, we just have Abraham questioning God. Now, I don't believe Abraham was questioning God's promise. I believe he was questioning God's timing. Sometimes that's what happens to us. We might not question what God has promised. But we certainly question his timing. Notice something about this interchange. And it goes on for the rest of the chapter. God he continues to question different things. 
God patiently listens and answers. Friends, the thing that I really think this passage challenges in us today is this idea of believing God. Do you believe God? Do you believe Him? Be careful now. Do you believe Him? Every promise that God has made to us in Scripture, do you believe it? Do, do you believe everything that God has said in this Word will come to pass? Do you believe that? Because you see, everything in your flesh and everything in this world is going to try to knock that out of you. Every bit of it. Our fight is not with flesh and blood. It's with powers and principalities that want to convince you that this life is what is ultimate. What you can verify with your, your physical senses, what you can touch, what you can taste, what you can feel, what you can control. Because you see, that's the issue here. Control. That was what's behind Abram's question of God about this man that was in his household that was a slave that he had already named his heir. You see, Abram had already in his mind began to make a backup plan for God. God, I'm not seeing your promise come to pass, so I'm going to help you along a little bit, God. I'm going to prime the pump, God. Because, you know, we got to help God along. Y'all know that church. God could not do anything without us helping Him along. Y'all understand that? The sun wouldn't have come up this morning if we didn't help Him along. All the promises that God has made in this Word, we got to help Him along. Somehow we've got to, to do these things, do this, this, and this in order to get God, God's plan to come to fruition. That's kind of what Abram's doing here. God, I'm going to prime the pump. I'm going to help you along. And God... I'm going to make this man my heir and you can, you can make me a great nation through him. And God said, that's not what I said, Abram. I said there was going to be an heir coming from your body. Who in here would consider themselves to be a control freak? Y'all, some, some of y'all are lying because I know you. Raise your hand. You are a control freak. You want to control everything in your environment. You want to make sure everybody and everything is where it's supposed to be. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. And even your relationship with God. You've convinced yourself that so much of that depends on you. But what does the scripture say in verse 6? Abram believed God. Can we talk about that a minute? What does it mean to believe God? Now, some would say it means to believe in God. We, we believe that God, who in here believes God exists? We, we believe He exists. We believe He's up there somewhere. We believe that that, 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 you know, that He is this being that has created the heavens and the earth. He started all this and He's there somewhere. We believe in Him. Is that what that text said? Is that, is that what it, did it say? Abraham believed in the Lord and he credited it to him as right. Is that what it says? See, James over in the New Testament says, even the demons believe in God. And they even are afraid. So what he's talking about here is not simply believing that God exists. You know, there's something that people say sometimes, and it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. When people refer to God as the man upstairs, please don't say that around me. I mean, I, I cringe. He's not the man upstairs. 
So here, it's not just to believe in this being. It's to believe God. See, faith always has an object. We always place our faith in something. See, that's what belief really is. Belief is not simply acknowledging something's existence. It it has this element of trust in it. Where we trust that the object of our faith is going to be able to do exactly what he said he was going to do. Abram believed. That God was able to produce an heir through him. Even though he was 100 years old and his wife was 90 and barren. He believed that somehow God was going to create an heir through this union. And that that particular heir was was going to have this, this family. Create this family that was going to be more numerous than the stars in the sky. He believed that God was going to do that. And because of that, God credited it to him as righteousness. He trusted that God was able to do what he said he was going to do. Now church, let's let's talk about that with us. Do you believe that God is able to do in your life, what he said he could do. Do you believe that? Or do you find yourself trusting other things? See, I believe that the American church is in the state that the American church is in. Because we have decided that we can accomplish something for God. That through our sheer ingenuity and creativity, we can create a church in America that is big, that is going to be winsome to the world, that is going to draw a crowd for Jesus. Now in that, there there is some nobility. We we definitely want to be winsome in the sense that we are winning people to Christ. We want to be attractive in a sense that we are inviting people who might not have faith yet, but want to come and and check out the claims of Scripture about Jesus. So we want our, our church to be welcoming to people. Friends, when we decide that through our creativity and ingenuity we can build God's church, we're not believing. We're not acting in faith. We're not demonstrating by our action that God is totally sufficient. You see, it's God that builds His church. Somehow we got this backwards. You know, Jesus was pretty clear. Getting ready to drive John Derringer crazy. Coming down here. Jesus was very clear with what we in the church are supposed to be responsible for. He said we're to to go and make disciples of all nations. That's our job, right? Make disciples. In Acts chapter 2, the very end, you you know what happened in Acts chapter 2, right? Jesus has ascended to the Father. He has told His disciples to go and wait for Him in Jerusalem until the coming of the promise He gave them that He was going to send the Holy Spirit to fill them. So they're gathered in an upper room with the door shut, scared to death. 120 of them up there praying for everything they're worth because they thought that a cross was fixing to be their future. They're scared to death. They're up there praying. You you know, it's nothing like a problem to make us urgent in prayer. Amen? Amen? They're up there praying and they're just asking God to do what He promised. And guess what happened? 
God did what he said. They're praying and all of a sudden they hear something like a mighty rushing wind blowing among them. And all of a sudden they're looking around and there's these little tongues of fire appearing over people's heads. That's weird, isn't it? That'll mess up a nice orderly worship service, won't it? I mean, all of a sudden, just hearing wind and all of a sudden. And then all of a sudden, these folks get so excited, they go out into the street. Now, remember, they're in there hiding. They're scared to death. They're scared they're going to get hauled off and, and crucified. But yet now they're so filled with passion and fire for Jesus. They go out the doors and they start speaking to people. See, in the that day of Passover festival, people from all over the world were in Jerusalem. And they were all gathered there, people from all the nations and different languages. And here these folks, 120 of them, go out of this room when they got the wind blowing and fire over their heads. They go out and they start preaching. And something really cool happened. They're preaching and speaking in languages they had never learned. And people are hearing the gospel in their language. And wouldn't that be cool, y'all? We get so excited up in here, so filled with God's spirit. We go out and we, you know, we go to the, the, the Chinese restaurant right down the road, right after service. And we stand in there ordering our food. Next thing you know, we start busting out Mandarin Chinese. And that person behind the counter is like, when did you learn Chinese? You know, I didn't. Let me tell you about Jesus. The result was 3,000 people said Jesus is Lord. And the church was birthed. Fast forward, last verses of that chapter. We get a description of life among those first disciples. They were gathering in the temple courts and from house to house daily. They were hanging out around the apostles' doctrine and they were breaking bread together. They were, they were enjoying the fellowship of the church. And then we get it. And the Lord was adding to the church daily those that were being saved. Did, did you get it, Leah? The Lord. The Lord was adding to the church. Not some church growth strategy that Peter cooked up. Not some big event designed to engage our community. Not we're going to hide a dollar under every chair and then we're going the lucky guy who's sitting in the chair gets the dollar just for being here, just to draw a crowd. No. The Lord. The Lord. See, God always does what he says what promise are you waiting for in your life you know the, the good thing about being a part of one church for about 20 well next Sunday it'll be 23 years the great thing about that is you've gone through seasons of life with people and I look across this, this church, and I know I've only been the pastor at Riverbend. We've only been Riverbend one year. So some of you, this is my first year with you. But I've seen you go through some stuff in this life. I've watched you believe God. Now, do y'all think Abram had any idea in the world how God was going to do this? I mean, he had no clue. I'm no rocket scientist, but folks who are 100 years old and 90 years old very rarely have children. Your cake's ready. <laughs> I mean, very rarely do people of that age have children, right? Abram... Here, we're told he believed God. Now, we're going to see it again in a few chapters. After this child is born, the one that, that God said, I'm going to give you Isaac. Then God says, hey, Abram, here's what I want you to do. I want to take Isaac, your one and only son, and I want you to carry him up to Mount Moriah. 
And there I want you to sacrifice him to me. You know what's curious about that account? And you can check it out a little bit later. There's no indication that Abram argued with God at all. He packed up the boy, packed up the wood, started the journey to Mount Moriah. And even when he was asked by the servants, where's the sacrifice? Well, actually by Isaac, where's the sacrifice? He says to his son, the Lord's going to provide. When he gets there and he gets the wood, he says to the servants, he turns and says, look, me and the boy, we're going to go up here and worship and we will come back to you. Now, I want you to notice here on the internal evidence of the text itself. Obviously, Abraham was very obedient to God. Right? Who in here, if God told you to go sacrifice your kid, you do it. I know on their days and you want to. I get it. I get it. But how many of you would take your beloved child and kill it? But here we got Abraham saying, okay, God, I really don't understand this, but here we go. Hey, Dad, we got the fire, we've got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? (laughs) Boy, you it. No. No, No, he says, God's going to provide. See, right there, faith. God, I don't understand this because you said this is going to be the heir. This one is where this would. This is the answer to the promise you gave me. And I don't understand this. I don't know why. But I know, God, you've promised that through him, the son of promise, you're going to raise up a a numerous nation. So I don't understand this, God, but I'm going to believe you. I'm going to keep walking because, God, you've not failed me yet. And he was going gets to the foot of the mountain, takes the boy, takes the wood, and then says, hey, me and the boy are going to go up here and work. He's saying, we're going to come back. I don't know how we're coming back. I don't know if we, I don't get it, but we are coming back. I don't know if I ever am thinking, okay, I'm going to kill him, and God's going to raise him up. I don't know. All I know is Abram believed God. And he kept walking. Gets up there on that mountain. Takes his son. The son of promise. Ties him up. Puts him on the altar. And raises the knife. And just when he's getting ready to bring that knife down and kill his son. God speaks. Something like that. <laughs> no, that was Isaac on the uh, altar. <laughs> oh, hey, hold up, Dad. God speaks. And he says, stay your hand. Now I know. Now I know you believe me. And then he looks and caught over in the wood. By its horns is a ram. Y'all don't miss the significance of that. God killed a ram. All you Carolina fans in here. What wasn't a wolf? Wasn't a wolf. Just saying. Wasn't a wolf. It was a ram. God provided exactly as He promised. Don't miss that. Probably shouldn't have made that joke because I don't want you to miss this. God did what He said. But notice what it took. Abram had to keep moving, didn't he? Even when it didn't make sense. Even when... Everybody around you was probably questioning the the sanity of this move. You know, conventional wisdom says this, and I see you going this way. It won't make any sense. God said. God said. Even those closest to you might question your motive. Hey, Dad, where's the sacrifice? God said He'd provide.
See, folks, we got to get comfortable with the fact that sometimes, sometimes God will ask us to do the unthinkable. Because He wants to test the metal of our belief. See, some of the stuff you're in right now, some of the situations you're facing right now, and you're blaming the devil, the devil didn't have a thing in the world to do with it. It's all a part of God helping you grow up. God wants His church to grow up. God wants us who say we truly believe God to start acting like it. Do, do we really believe Him, y'all? Then why is it we'll run to just about every source we can find when we have a problem trying to get wisdom for our situation? Why is it we'll, we'll, we'll go to the self-help aisle of Barnes & Noble and try to find all sorts of books and resources to help us discover how we are supposed to live to get the life that we want? Call up 17 friends. What do you think about this situation? What do you think? And almost take a poll. Worse yet, we often surround ourselves with an echo chamber. People who will simply parrot back to us what we want to hear. Watch who you allow to be in your circle, by the way. Watch it. But yet, God has promised us in His Word that He will shepherd us. Do we believe God? Do we believe Him? I didn't ask you, did you believe in Him? Do you believe Him? Do you really believe that God will do what He said? God's a man of His Word. He's always going to do what He said. If you think you can figure out some loopholes in this word. If y'all don't think Abram was walking up there with his son trying to find a loophole. I guarantee he was searching to find print. Let me find a way not to do this. But God said. But God said. Church. If we truly want to see the promises of God fulfilled in our lives, we've got to obey and we've got to trust. Abram here for all of his flaws, and we've established his flaws in this, 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 this book of Genesis already, hadn't we? He was a flawed man just like you and just like me. But for all of his flaws, he believed God. Do you believe him? What are you believing him for? What are you, are you, are, are you believing him for what he said in his word? Because now you might be sitting here this morning believing him for a new car. You, you might be sitting in here believing him for a new house. You might be in here believing Him for a new job or, or believing Him for... I'm not talking about treating God like a celestial Santa Claus. You know, you send Him your little letter to the North Pole. God, this is what I want on my wish list. I'm not talking about treating God like a celestial slot machine. You know, I put in my tithe. I'm not talking about treating God like a, like a genie up in heaven. Where if we rub him just the right way and stroke his ego enough, he's going to give us three wishes and give us all the things that we desire. Why is it that some of the most depressed people in our culture are rich? 
How many of those documentaries have we got to see on TV when they stand up and say, I had it all, but I was empty inside? How many do we have to find dead in, in, in their jacuzzis to understand that the life that they tried to build for themselves was empty and shallow because the only life that's going to provide for you what you truly want is a life that stands on the promises of God. That's what God has for you. That's what you truly want. But so long as you try to do it yourself, to forge your own way, never going to see the promises of God come to fruition in your life. Abraham not going to let admit that I know God is true to you. I don't understand this. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. But I know whose I am. And I know greater is he that's in me than that which is in the world. Do y'all believe that? Greater is he that is in me than that which is in the world. No matter what's in front of me, I know that God can drive me through because my God is bigger than whatever's right there. If your God isn't bigger than what's right there, you got the wrong one. If you got to help your God out, prime the pump, you got the wrong one. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Paul, the God of Peter, the God of all of the saints mentioned in this book, he is bigger bigger than anything. So today, do you believe God? Do you believe Him? You too, baby. Do you believe Him? Let's stand. Father, I come to you right now and I just pray that you lift our eyes off of this present evil age. And that, God, you would let us see you. God, you are far greater than we could ever dream. Your love for us is so big so perfect that you would send your one and only son to die in our place so that we could have a relationship with you. God, forgive us when we put our eyes on earthly things. When we allow the things of this world to cloud our vision of your promises in Scripture. Lord, I pray that in this place today that every one of us in this room would just ask ourselves the question, do I truly believe God? Holy Spirit, help us to see. Help us to see. Bring conviction, Lord, on the areas of our lives that we're just not believing you in, God. We're trying to fix stuff. We're we're trying to eke our own way out in this life. And, And God, I pray that you just convict us that as hard as we might work, as As hard as we might try, God, we cannot create a life 
apart from you that's going to truly satisfy us. God, let us, let us see that. Holy Spirit, show us so that we can repent today and start following Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much for the example of Abram. God, he's a lot like we are, yet he believed you. God, may we believe you today. Lord, our righteousness comes through our belief in Jesus. Trusting Him with our lives. Trusting Him as Lord. Trusting that finished work at the cross to save us. I pray that today, Lord, there's anybody in this room that hasn't trusted Christ Holy Spirit would you please open their eyes to see Jesus Father I pray this in your powerful name Amen I want to invite the prayer team to come up front as we finish out the service this morning with some worship the prayer team is going to be up here and if the Holy Spirit is urging you to respond today. And if you want to come and just pray at this altar, that's cool. But if you want to pray with someone, especially those of you who feel that draw to, to, to say Jesus is Lord and surrender your life to Him, we'd love to pray with you and help you take those first steps. We're here to pray for you about any situation in your life, anything that's going on. Maybe there's an area that you're not trusting God in. We want to pray with you about that. You can't fix it. Broken people don't generally fix stuff, right? You can't fix it. But God can. He can. So we just invite you to come and let's pray together and seek God's plan, His perfect plan for your life. So as we worship you, won't you come? Seems like all I could see was a struggle. Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past. Bound up shackles of all my failures, wondering how long is this going to last, and then you look at the prisoner they say to me, son, stop fighting a fight, it's already shame and every breath. But when I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. I am redeemed. Because I don't have 
God redeemed. I am so glad that you joined us both here and online this morning because we as always talk about it is so important that we as his children gather together to support one another if you're not a member of a life group please make sure you stop by the connect center and check out